as you know, we're very concerned here with freedom of expression and the right to have a view that may not be the orthodoxy. And we saw that really come to a head uh, within the last couple of years in Canada with the, the big truck as well. Call it what you will, protest. We're going to hear more about this. Uh, Adrian, who is about to speak to us now, I admit to my shame, I didn't realize, has been to symposiums before. Because you, you see faces and they're in a different context and suddenly... Here he is today as a speaker. That's really wonderful. So Adrian has a very interesting history, if you haven't read your programs. He is somebody that once upon a time learned that believing in people that sort of promise a lot and don't deliver isn't always so good. And you can see some of uh, his uh, work out on the table. But yeah, particularly the freedom issues and what happened in Canada, it has a lesson, we think, for us all. And we're now going to hear about that today and uh, see if we can avoid the worst in future. So I'm going to give a big hand, please, to Mr. Adrian C. Smith. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you here today, back in Glastonbury again. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Canadian Freedom Convoy, the protest that represents, I think, a great revival of Canadian values and Canadian identity. The title of my talk is The Emperor Has No Clothes, derived from a folk tale by Hans Christian Andersen about a very vain, narcissistic, arrogant and tyrannical dictator, obsessed with his public image, <laughs> who was deceived by two swindling weavers who promised to create for him the most magnificent, magnificent suit of clothes ever devised. And he could not resist that. But it came with a proviso that only the, the wise, the competent, and the virtuous would be able to see it. But the foolish, the incompetent, and the deplorables would not be able to see it. So he was wandering around naked all the time. And um, I would say that the public reaction is in three categories. Category one people are very wedded to the idea that everything is normal, that nothing is out of the ordinary. Um, those people face what's called cognitive dissonance. Uh, they are confronted with um, the evidence of their own eyes, which they must deny, uh, because uh, they are so wedded to this concept that everything is normal. We call them normies. I'm going to read something from George Orwell, which describes this cognitive dissonance very well. Winston sank into the labyrinthine world of doublethink. To know and not to know. To be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies. To hold simultaneously two opinions which cancelled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them. To use logic against logic, to repudiate morality while laying claim to it, to believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was the guardian of democracy, to forget whatever it was necessary to forget. So they fall into a kind of sleep and a forgetting. It gets pushed down into the subconscious. They forget that they've forgotten, but there's always an underlying tension always an underlying discomfort. It's just disappeared from the conscious awareness. I think it's about time I introduced you to the emperor that in my story. <laughs> no surprises here, I don't think. <laughs> ah, I was going to come to that. Good point. <laughs> There's a contradiction already. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm going to be talking a lot about contradictions and inconsistencies, because contradictions are actually a form of mind control. When you are constantly bombarded with contradictions and you push them away, it stuns the critical faculties and you become more open to suggestion. So already he's done something which woke people aren't supposed to do, which is called cult uh, cultural appropriation. You can get in big trouble for that. So every day, a new suit of clothes. Uh, this was uh, on a trip, to a state visit to India. So a lot of contradictions here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Lord Sumption, retired senior justice of the Supreme Court, the UK Supreme Court. The, tr the truckers' protest was about uh, mandates having to do with uh, the recent popular plague, which I'm not allowed to talk about explicitly. Uh, this is what Lord Sumption had to say about lockdowns. He was a, a, a vocal critic of lockdown. If we confer con despotic powers on governments to deal with perils, which are an ordinary feature of human existence, we will end up doing it most or all of the time. So there's this kind of creeping totalitarianism. They never go back on it. They always keep forward, keep marching it forward. It never gets rescinded. So lockdowns are a potential pathway to totalitarianism. People willingly surrender their freedoms in response to some threat, something that makes them afraid. And but fear does strange, thing, strange things to people. That, too, kind of anesthetizes the critical faculty. So people don't stop to ask, is this measure really necessary? Does it actually work? They don't ask those kind of questions. Uh, the, the common law is uh, something which really enshrines the individual citizen as the primary unit of governance and responsibility. Uh, so that the common law presumes that the average citizen is a rational actor, and that he or she knows how to do their own risk assessments and take their own precautions. We don't need Big Brother for that. Of course, all these things are done for our own good. And as C.S. Eliot says, people who torment us for our own good will torment us to no end. An interesting little uh, song was composed by a neighbor of mine. Stay safe, stay out of trouble. This is part of the lyrics. Stay safe, stay out of trouble. Be like the boy in the plastic bubble. Danger, danger everywhere. Dangerous people breathing dangerous air. Stay in your bungalow, it's safer in there. So what I'm finding out through all this is that the real geniuses are your neighbors the people next door, people you've never met, because we've been conditioned to relate vertically up a, the chain of command instead of horizontally by reaching out to our neighbors for our wisdom, our support, our mutual support. And one of the most wonderful byproducts of this protest in Canada, and I'm sure this is, I know it's happening in the UK also, is that <clears throat> people are discovering their community, discovering their horizontal connections. To isolate the sick is quarantine. To isolate the healthy is tyranny. The Supreme Court of Canada has always been asking, is the measure necessary and proportional? This was a plague that was really not much different than the 
than the Asian flu of 1957 or the Hong Kong flu of 1968, certainly much less severe than the, the Spanish flu of 1918. What was unprecedented about it? Nothing unprecedented about the plague, but what was unprecedented was locking down an entire healthy population. That was something that was never done in history. So let's move along to the lead up to the protest, the sequence of events when the plague got started. The border was closed March 20th, except that the truckers were given essential workers exemption to keep the flow of trade going. And because they lived virtually isolated within the cabs of their trucks, they were not considered to be high risk. That situation prevailed until the border was opened on August the 9th, 2021. It was open to those who had received the Jabberwocky. And they could prove it. But once again, the truckers were granted uh, essential workers' exemption. No one questioned this. No one said there was anything the matter with it. Fast forward to June of, excuse me, yes, to June of 2022. So we've gone through more than two years of without a problem. These um, I'm sorry, I got my, my order incorrect. Effective on January 15th of 2022, the essential workers exemption was removed. So we've gone through the whole pandemic and just at the time when things were starting to open back up again, the emperor imposes this requirement on truckers crossing the border. They would either show proof of the Jabberwocky, or would have to quarantine at their own expense for two weeks, which essentially knocked them out of being a trucker. So this prevented about 10 to 20% of cross-border trade in Canadian truckers, and up to 40% of American truckers. So it started to exacerbate already stretched supply chains and economic hardship. Trucking, truckers associations were in an uproar, and this is what started the whole ball rolling with the, tra the, tra with <clears throat> the protest. And as we heard earlier, people don't stop to ask, does this make sense? It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever on any grounds, medical, health, nothing, economic. So a few truckers got together and decided, well, we'll go up to Ottawa and protest. And uh, a Native American grandmother named Tamara Leach decided she was going to do a fundraiser to help them out. Uh, she thought $25,000 would be a good start with uh, GoFundMe. Her friend said, oh, you're being way too conservative. Let's go for $250,000. So they had a bit of a discussion, came up with $100,000. So they started out with $100,000. And guess where it ended up? Ten million dollars. And yes. <laughs> and uh, most of it was small donations. The average size of the donation was fifty dollars. Suddenly, this whole thing just started to explode. They were coming from the Northwest Territories. They were coming from the South. They were coming from the East. It became a huge logistical problem. Uh, so many truckers on the road passing, needing to get fuel. They have to arrange for staging areas and petrol trucks to refuel them because they, the gas stations would run out of fuel. A lot of small trucks joined in. The, they didn't sleep in their trucks, so the hotels were full, the motels were full, the restaurants were full. And when they hit Ottawa, the Coming from the west, the, it was about 100 kilometers long, and it would take one hour to pass. And it was about 5,000 trucks 
that landed in Ottawa and about 15,000 people. Now this was turned into something resembling a big street festival. It was like there were bouncy castles for the kids and barbecues and sound stages, an entertainment dance, a lot of Native American regalia, drumming. It was just fun. And um, the, um, there's a saying about Ottawa, it's not the most interesting place in the world, they say, it's the city that fun forgot. So <laughs> there were a lot of people that were uh, unhappy about it. Uh, you know, the idea of blue-collar workers coming to Ottawa to enter into collective bargaining should be something that would interest a socialist party like Trudeau's, but apparently not. He had characterized them before they even arrived as terrorists. The terrorists were on their way to trash the capital. So a lot of businesses were afraid and closed down. They closed down a big shopping center. But then when people got to find out, well, they're not so, they're, these people are really nice and they're fun people, they started opening up and anybody that was open did you know, wonderful business after two years of hotels were full, restaurants were full. Trudeau ran away, you know, run away, run away. He, um, he fled the city to the safety of uh, Harrington Lake and the prime ministerial cottage surrounded by his security team. What was it that had him so afraid? I think this is more the face of the protest than what Trudeau had in mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, through all this, what's he saying about the truckers? A fringe minority with unacceptable views, racists, misogynists, white supremacists, They take up space. He's speaking now about the people who didn't get the Jabberwocky. That's a rather ominous thing to say, I think. What do you do with something that takes up space? Hmm. They don't believe in science, and through it all, and they keep bear this in mind, through it all in the parliament, everything that he was doing was based on the science. We follow the science. These people don't believe in science. He talks about people being harassed in their neighborhoods, confronted with the inherent violence of a swastika flag. And I, I must mention that throughout the protest, all of the overpasses and the sides of the roads were full of people waving the Canadian flag and in Quebec, the Quebec flag. I don't know what they're talking about. I, it just wasn't, it wasn't happening. Stealing food from the homeless he says, hmm. Desecrating the war memorial? A lot of these people were veterans, a lot of veterans, and destroying local businesses. I mentioned to you earlier that the reason that local businesses were hurt was because of the narrative. The terrorists are coming to trash the city, so close your business. <clears throat> I have a statement that he wrote here. It's almost hard for me to read it, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> Over the past few days, Canadians have been shocked and frankly disgusted by the behavior displayed by some people protesting in our nation's capital. I want to be very clear. He says that a lot. We're not intimidated by those who hurl abuse at small business workers and steal fruit from the homeless. We won't give in to those who fly racist flags, and we won't cave to those engaged in vandalism or dishonor the memory of our veterans. There is no place in Canada for this behavior. So to those responsible, it needs to stop. Um, yes, well, 
I'll read a quote from a lady by the name of Rupa Subrabhyamna. She's an economist and a, uh, writing for the National Post, a woman of color from India, obviously not a white supremacist. She spent three weeks. I have spoken to close to 100 protesters, truckers, and other folks, and not one of them sounded like an insurrectionist, white supremacist, racist, or misogynist. So we have truth, we have anti-truth. That's something that is not only untrue, but flipped upside down. We're looking at anti-truth. There was a roster of speakers, very prominent speakers, one of them the only living signatory to Canada's Constitution and Bill of Rights. And Canada's Constitution dates back to 1982. His name is Brian Peckford. So he was there in support of the truckers. Uh, he himself is involved in a lawsuit suing the federal government over one of its mandates. A similar kind of situation, no medical justification for it whatsoever. There was a man named uh, Danny Bulford who was a, a member of the RCMP, charged with the personal protection of the emperor himself, who resigned in protest. He was there in support of the truckers. And a whole team developed around this rather spontaneous eruption. But it got so huge that it needed some kind of, some kind of management. And Danny Fulford was there negotiating with the police, making sure emergency lanes were open. Um, and a military type was um, there as well to help out. And they took over a room at the Swiss Hotel. And someone said it looked like uh, NASA mission control. <laughs> a lot of computer screens. And so there was a lot of liaison with the police. There was no problem with the police. Uh, the police didn't say that anyone was doing anything wrong. The interesting thing about this protest is that it's the only protest that I'm aware of that never ended in some form of dialogue or negotiation. For example, in 2020, there was a nationwide rail protest where protesters destroyed rail junctions, blockaded railway tracks, um, there was violence, uh, truckers with axes and masks attacked a pipeline workers camp, they set fire to a truck with people in it, and they injured an RCMP officer. Now because uh, railways are so critical to the Canadian economy, this was catastrophic to the economy. It was nationwide, there was violence. Um, but, and it lasted for three months. This protest, if you count the time in Ottawa, was only 17 days. And for 17 days, Ottawa was an interesting place. So the railways protest went on for three months, but there was negotiation right from the get-go. They were negotiating the whole way through. Similarly, in Ecuador, there was a negotiation where Native people created a protest over oil companies violating their ancestral lands. There was a lot of violence. Food was disappearing from the shelves. There was a negotiation, an eventual compromise, and a settlement. Similarly, the emperor likes to advertise himself as very tolerant. But when you hear rhetoric like they take up space, only oh, says, how long do we tolerate these people? That sounds a little ominous to me. But again, I'm, we're talking about contradiction here. Trudeau the tolerant, 
Very tolerant of real terrorists, yes, the Boston bomber, he says. But there is no question that this happened because of someone who feels completely excluded, someone who feels completely at war with innocence, at war with society. Trudeau finished by saying that it was important not to marginalize these people. Well, I agree with that, but you know what? what about our poor truckers here? Even further, who already feel like they are enemies of society rather than people who have hope for the future. So again, we have this contradiction in his behavior which people push into their subconscious, pretend that they don't see it. And on, a, on this state visit to India, he created an international incident by inviting to dinner an ex-terrorist. The Indian government was outraged. In the Times of India, dinner invitation to ex-terrorist clouds Canadian PM Trudeau's visit. And I want to talk now, I am, uh, as, a, as a result of this protest, um, Trudeau did not negotiate, he refused to negotiate. First time I've ever seen this happen. He invokes the Emergencies Act, which is an act that is usually invoked in wartime situation, where there's a real disaster going on, a last resort because all other resources have failed. So let me just pull up the Emergencies Act onto the screen. The predecessor to the Emergencies Act was something called the War Measures Act from 1914. It was in introduced, it was only invoked three times, once in World War I, uh, where at the time Ukrainian citizens were interned World War II, where it was used to intern Japanese Canadians, and the third time in October of 1970, the October crisis, and this was uh, the FLQ, Front de la Libération du Québec, the Quebec Liberation Front. Bombs were going off in mailboxes. Uh, some diplomats were kidnapped. One of them was murdered. Trudeau and his cabinet got together to decide whether they should invoke the War Measures Act. And they decided against it. They said it wasn't sufficient to justify the suspension of all civil liberties. But the mayor of Montreal made an intervention and told them, uh, you're making a big mistake. This is much bigger than you think. There's arms, caches everywhere. There's going to be uh, something like an insurrection. Uh, and they bowed to his conclusion. So arrests were made without warrant or without cause. Um, and eventually it wound down. After the fact, it was decided. Now, we know from the minutes of the meeting between Trudeau and his cabinet that they were against it. But how times have changed. How times have changed since then. They brought in, after the review of the whole business, they considered it an overreach by government. And they brought in the Ur Emergencies Act to make it much more stringent, to make it much more difficult. So these, the, what you see on the screen now is what is required in order to invoke the Emergencies Act to suspend civil liberties. And as many of you may know, he used it to make a lot of arrests and to suspend the bank accounts of people who made donations to the, to the convoy. But here's what is required by them. They have to justify it. Threats to the security of Canada so serious as to be a national emergency. 
one which seriously endangers the lives, health, and safety of Canadians. Threat or use of serious violence against persons or property occurring on or before the date of invocation. That's very important, that wording, occurring on or before the date of invocation. Because they tried to say that they were afraid of what might happen. But the act specifically excludes that by saying the violence has to occur on the date of the invocation or before. One which exceeds the capacity or authority of a province to deal with. That is to say, Canada is a federal state. We have 10 provinces and 10 plus territories. Uh, they each have their own jurisdiction, their own, in, in most cases, their own police force. So we have three levels of policing, the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Ontario Provincial Police, and this is in Ottawa, the capital is in Ontario, and the, uh, the Ottawa Police. The emergency could not be effectively dealt with by any other law. It has to be a last resort. An emergency may be invoked if the requirements of the act are met. Otherwise, no lawful or st statutory authority to act. Now, the Emergencies Act specifically does not preclude Canada's Constitution, so this uh, action taken by the government is reviewable by the Supreme Court. Uh, and they could decide that it was unlawfully invoked, which would create a lot of problems for the Trudeau regime. Also in the Emergencies Act was the requirement for a public order emergency investigation commission to look into all the circumstances surrounding it, they appointed a judge from the Ontario Supreme Court, Justice Paul Rouleau, who would render an opinion at the end of the process. And I've summarized, there was like, uh, let's see here, there was 7,000 documents, 77 witnesses, six weeks of hearings. I've got a transcript of the whole thing, I've got video. I have summarized the findings, but they're all supported by the testimony. And that's one very important thing about this commission, is that it is an objective analysis based on testimony of the Prime Minister himself, his Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Friedland, health officials, police officials, representatives of the security agencies. So when you hear a lot of honking in a city, you might, depending on your political point of view, it might sound like trumpeting angels, or it might sound like a terrible public nuisance. It just depends on your perspective. But this kind of puts everything into an objective basis so that you know, I'm not exaggerating here. So the first item is the CSIS. You may have recalled from the earlier slide, you have to have a national emergency that threatens national security. CSIS, Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, no credible evidence of a threat to national security. Also from the testimony and the witnesses, the protesters were never told at any time that they were doing anything wrong. It was a peaceful protest. The police did not arrest anybody, or even tell them that they shouldn't do it. So the central point that the government was relying upon was violence. Witnesses were asked repeatedly, was there any violence, any actual violence? And the answer was always no. No one was prepared to say under oath that there was any violence. So how then did they justify it? They called it felt violence. And they called it microaggressions. 
Uh, uh, so we're getting into an area here that, uh, is, that I talk about a lot in my book. It's called postmodernism. Postmodernism don't, postmodernists don't believe that there's anything resembling an objective reality. Everything is your perception. Now, that's fine as a philosophy, but when it starts interfering with legal processes, it means an end to the rule of law. And if you have an end to the rule of law, you have what is left, the rule of force. Because if you can make a word mean anything you want it to be, you can have no rule of law. Silence is violence, some people say. How strangely will the tools of the tyrant pervert the plain meaning of words? That was written by Samuel Adams in 1776. So nothing new here. They have to do away with the, the plain meaning of words to introduce the law of force. Another thing, too, very central to the English Constitution is the concept of the separation of powers, the idea being that no one arm of government should dominate the other. So legislative, executive, police, judiciary, they act as a check or a balance on one another. And when that disappears, you have a tyranny that was goes back many hundreds of years. The, it was invented in this country. The French philosophers copied it. They admitted that their vision of constitutional government was derived from this country. So what we are witnessing here is an erosion of that principle. Because our Justice Rouleau uh, decided that the very stringent requirements of the Emergencies Act was met. So what we have here is a justice who has been politicized. So he's no longer acting as a check or a balance on the exercise of power. He's acting like a tool of the government. I should continue down this list. Um, no charges were laid or arrests made in Ottawa. No police representatives made a request for help. The police were always advocating dialogue. Government officials were not able to deny any evidence that they pre-planned the narrative. Truckers were to be labeled as terrorists before the protest even began. The lawyers were able to produce a letter from the deputy prime minister, Christia Friedland. It was a handwritten note addressed to the head of CSIS before the protest even got rolling. She said, quote, we need to characterize these people as terrorists, unquote. The lawyers asked her, well, do you consider them to be terrorists? And she said, it's not for me to say. Well, there's another contradiction. If it wasn't for her to say, why was she asking Ceases to say it? Uh, an agreement was reached the day before the invocation of the act to begin moving trucks from the downtown area of Ottawa. That was on February the 13th. Trudeau invoked the, war, uh, the um, Emergencies Act on the, the day afterwards. I think what was happening here, he was doing everything that he possibly could to provoke a situation, but it wasn't working. I think it wasn't working, maybe, maybe it wasn't working because there were some good people who were on to all this and they were advising people not to get too worked up about it. <clears throat> 
there were military officers, police officers, ex-police officers who knew what the game was. But what I think happened, because the provocations weren't working, he panicked because he dearly wanted to introduce this, this Emergency Measures Act. He panicked because he saw it was starting to wind down on its own. And of course, all the legislation required that it be a last resort. RCMP commissioner testified that all options were not exhausted. The police were well equipped to deal with it under existing laws, they said. There was no medical justification for the cross-border mandate. And Trudeau admits this under oath. He said, no, there was no medical justification for it. Why then did he do it? It was to encourage the Jabberwocky. Now, enshrined in Canadian law and in international law through the Nuremberg Convention is that any medical intervention, any medical procedure must be pursuant to informed consent. You have to have consent. And any departure from that is criminal. But in order to have consent, it must be freely given. If someone coerces you or under, puts you under duress, that completely invalidates the consent or nullifies it. Trudeau testifies he never called the unjabberwocky names. Now that was a, now we're getting into some serious territory here. Now here's an interesting one. Trudeau testifies, it's okay to protest, but not if government policy is challenged. I want to make a comment about this because I've been hitting Trudeau awfully hard here, and you might say, well, Canada is a country that's got a prime minister that went off the rails, that uh, so what, you know? But um, Trudeau never says anything, not, he never makes an idle comment that is not from a script. In fact, his own brother, half-brother, testified or not testified, but uh, spoke at the, at the protest. And he said that his brother was reading from a script. And he says he's talked to his brother. Last time was a couple of years ago. Tried to reason with him. Trudeau says, I'm not allowed to talk about these things. I'll just read a few things that were said from the transcript itself. This is from the testimony of Ontario Provincial Police Superintendent Patrick Morris. The lack of violent crime at the protests was shocking. The lack of violence was shocking. <laughs> what do you think of that? When I read accounts that the people participating were un-Canadian, and that they were not Canadian views, and that they were extremists. I found it all to be very problematic, because what I ascertained from my role, which is I did not see validation for these assertions. Superintendent Morris testified that at no point during the convoy protest did he receive any reliable intelligence that would lead him to conclude that there was a risk to national security. I'm going to have to move along here because I see that I'm getting a little bit long-winded. <laughs> So why should we care what's happening in Canada? Well, it's because Trudeau has a boss. <laughs> uh, this is Dr. Evil. It's actually Mike Myers, who is a 
grew up in the same part of Toronto that I grew up in. And he grew up watching British comedies. So he became a great comedian in his own right. Dr. Evil's upset because he's be being challenged. His title is being challenged for the world's most evil man. And this guy is challenging it. Ooh. <laughs> The pandemic rep represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. So that's just what Lord Sumption was saying. They're going to use this as an opportunity to create a completely different set of values, a completely different social and economic system. And one of the things that they want to do is to wipe out every form of identity, to create a blank slate because this is going to be so different. So they want to wipe out the national identity, the national culture. So when Trudeau makes an idle comment, Canada has no national identity. That's just not stupid Trudeau saying something stupid. That's Trudeau obeying his bosses. Now, the thing about the emperor also, he is this man's hand-picked guy. For, for Schwab, Trudeau is their poster boy. And Canada is his pride. And he says, we are very proud of our Prime Minister Trudeau. And we penetrate the cabinets. He says, over half the Canadian cabinet is for us, for the World Economic Forum. And Christia Friedland, incidentally, is um, the deputy prime minister. She's on the board of trustees of the World Economic Forum. We are your single source of truth. Jacinda Ardern, another one sort of saying, all reading from the same script. But when you take something like that, you, we are your single source of truth. It's very, it sounds very much to me like a cult. Because in a cult, you're not allowed to listen to what somebody else might say. You have a single source of truth. There is to be no varying opinions that you can examine. I'm going to go back to what I originally said about the single truth teller having a disproportionate effect. It can be very contagious. And this is something written by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago. He spent many years in the Soviet labor camps post-World War II for writing a letter critical of Stalin. He um, became rather famous outside of the Soviet Union. Um, and according to a professor at Princeton University, he single-handedly blackened the name of the Soviet Union to everyone in the West. An example of how one man who does not live by lies, who lives by the truth, can have a really serious impact on the world. Thank you. <laughs> I guess I will conclude with this statement by, I'm not going to, no, I shouldn't, I was not quite concluding, but getting to the end. This was written by Vaclav Havel. He very much uh, advocated what we call the parallel society. He was a, a Soviet dissident living in Czechoslovakia, and in that time there was a lot of um, parallel systems emerging. They had their own art galleries, their own publishing houses, their own schools, their own theater. And this parallel system that was running alongside the Soviet system more or less took over by the time it started to collapse. And the crust presented by the life of lies 
is made of strange stuff. As long as it seals off hermetically the entire society, it appears to be made of stone. So as long as you're living in this world where there's no other truth but the official truth, and you can't get any, any outside information, it looks pretty solid. It looks pretty formidable. But the moment someone breaks through in one place, when one person cries out, the emperor is naked. When a single person breaks the rules of the totalitarian game, everything suddenly appears in another light. And the whole crust seems to be made of tissue on the point of tearing and disintegrating uncontrollably. That's from Vaclav Havel. And my next slide is of my blog site. I wrote a book called A Prison for the Mind, The Reflections of a Disappointed Fundamentalist. As in another life, I was the minister of a fundamentalist sect dominated by a very powerful, charismatic leader. I was eventually excommunicated from that group. Um, so the thing that is amazing for me is that all that I experienced in that experience of being a category one person, category two person, and a category three person, is that all this looks so familiar to me. So it's a, it's a question, I think, of mind control, social engineering. Uh, it's deja vu all over again for me. Uh, so I write extensively about it. I think what we're looking at here is some kind of a, a mind parasite. There was a, a great book written by Colin Wilson, esoteric author, called The Mind Parasite. A parasite is a creature that disguises itself as something that's beneficial to the host. It gets the host thinking that they're going to benefit from this relationship when in fact it's being drained and vampired off of. So that is what I think is happening. Um, there's a word for this in every different culture. The Algonquin Indians call it Huetico. The Yaqui Indians of Mexico call it, they call them flyers. The Muslims call them jinn. The Christians call them demons. And whether you want to look at that um, allegorically, symbolically, or literally, that's up to the hearer. But there's something going on of parasitism or vampirism, however you want to look at it. So I have um, the blog site. I have articles there on legal philosophy. I have a degree from the University of London in law. Um, and I, that is very great concern to me to see our legal principles being eroded by the religion of wokeness. I think that every empire has to have a religion. That's to give it the pious face that gets everybody comfortable with surrendering their powers to it. And I think that the religion of the new globalist empire is wokeness. That's what gives it a pious, we care about the disadvantaged and so on. So I write a lot about legal philosophy. I've written about cases here in England, the Harry Miller case, which I don't have time to go into, and about my own experience and about solutions. Yaklav Havel, reach out to your community. Parallel structures. We're seeing a spontaneous revival of national identity, personal identity personal freedom, values, the legal tradition, the common law. We're seeing it all being revived, and it's happening. And these people are going to fail. They always do. The only question is how much pain in the meantime until it happens. They don't know how to reverse gear. They can only go forward until it crashes and burns. But in the meantime, we have this hope of 
coming together in a way that I have never seen before happening in Canada. I'm sure it's happening here. And so I will conclude my remarks on that very positive note. If there are any questions, I will be on stage again tomorrow, and you can ask me then, or at any time, I'll be around. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Brilliant stuff. Yeah.